We live in a world full of wireless communication devices. From satellite communication equipment to smart homes, wearable devices, remote controls, and modern mobile phones, wireless communication has transformed the way we live. Thanks to rapid advancements in this field, we now take fast and reliable information access for granted. In this video, we will explore the basic building block of modern wireless communication systems and gain an understanding of how today's advanced wireless devices function. Nearly all modern wireless communication devices process information in digital form, having only ones or zeros. And there is a good reason for this. Digital signals make communication more efficient and robust against noise. Here is why. Imagine an analog signal traveling through the atmosphere to a receiver. Along the way, it gets attenuated and accumulates atmospheric noise, distorting the original waveform and making it difficult to recover. Now let's digitize the same signal into 8 discrete levels. The digitized signal will look like this. To corrupt this digital signal, the noise would need to reach a level comparable to at least half the size of quantization step. In short, Digital signals are more resilient because noise must exceed a higher threshold to corrupt the binary levels, whereas analog signals are affected continuously. Once digitized, the signal is represented using binary numbers. For example, the maximum level could be represented as 111 and the minimum as 000. But how do we transmit these digital bits wirelessly? The answer lies in electromagnetic waves which travel through free space at the speed of light. These waves are transmitted using antennas, but there is a challenge. The size of the antenna must match the wavelength of the wave. For low frequency signals, this would require impractically large antennas. For example, a quarter wavelength antenna for 20 Hz audio signal would need to be approximately 7500 km. To address this, we superimpose the low frequency signal onto a high frequency carrier wave through a process called modulation. For example, in an amplitude modulation, the audio signal alters the amplitude of the carrier wave. There is also phase modulation and frequency modulation, where the phase or frequency of the carrier changes based on digital signal. When dealing with digital signals, these modulations become more specific. For example, for shown digital bit stream, amplitude shift keying changes the amplitude of ones and zeros. Phase shift keying changes the phase and frequency shift keying changes the frequency. Let's take an example of phase shift keying. We can for example transmit electromagnetic waves for zero phase for logic 1 and 180 degree phase shift for logic 0. The receiver decodes these phases back into original bit stream. To understand how this is done, let's first clarify two basic concepts regarding wireless communication. The first concept of wireless communication is related to signal bandwidth. Every transmitted signal must occupy a specific frequency range or bandwidth. This is essential to avoid interference. As multiple users transmit a signal simultaneously, allocating specific frequency bands ensures that the signals do not overlap and interfere with one another. For instance, for GSM 900 standard, the downlink bands from base station to mobile phone range from 935 to 960 MHz with each user allowed to use a maximum bandwidth of 200 kHz. But how does this relate to transmitted signal bit stream? To understand the relationship between transmitted data and bandwidth, let's assume that we are transmitting a logic 1 for a time duration of t seconds. This means that the data rate of the transmission is 1 over t bits per second. It can be shown mathematically that the frequency domain representation of this bit will look like this. The main lobe will have a bandwidth of 2 over t hertz. So for example, if the bit rate was 1 megabits per second, this will correspond to a bandwidth of 2 megahertz in digital domain. However, we can also see some side lobes in frequency spectrum of bit stream. These side lobes can interact with other users transmitting in adjacent frequency channels. Therefore, the side lobes must be minimized. Well, the best case would be if the frequency spectrum would have been an exact square shape as shown. This kind of spectrum will be ideal for adjacent channels as no power is at the frequencies outside the specified bandwidth. 
However, when we look at the time domain representation of this signal, we realize that this kind of spectrum will be impossible to realize. The time domain signal producing this frequency response look like a sync function, but starting at minus infinity time. As generating a signal from minus infinity time is impossible to realize, we resort to a more practical and easier to generate time domain signal as shown. This kind of waveform is known as raised cosine pulse and does not have ripples extending to infinity. The frequency domain spectrum of this kind of waveform will have wider frequency bandwidth but minimum side lobes. Therefore, the user in adjacent channel can utilize frequencies separated by a guard band. This will eliminate possible interference issues in adjacent channels due to reduced side lobes of generated frequency spectrum. Now let's suppose logic 1 is followed by a logic 0 transmission. This can be sent with a negative sync waveform as shown and the overall digital bit stream in time domain will look something like this. Let's keep this concept in mind that logic 1 will be sent with a positive sync pulse while logic 0 will be sent with a negative sync pulse before going to the second concept regarding wireless communication. However, to keep the explanation of upcoming concepts simple, in later discussion, we will not represent logic 1 and logic 0 with sync pulses. Rather, logic 1 will be represented as plus 1 rectangular pulse, while logic 0 will be represented by a rectangular pulse of minus 1. Now let's move on on the second concept. You may have noticed that the digital pulse spectrum lies around the center frequency of 0 Hz. As we already discussed, this will impose challenges in the wireless transmission of signal because of unreasonably large antenna size. Moreover, as different communication standards require transmission in different frequency bands, we need a way to upconvert this frequency band around higher carrier frequency. This is done through a frequency multiplier circuit called a mixer. Mixer multiplies digital bitstream pulse with a high frequency carrier in time domain. As we know that the multiplication in time domain is equivalent to convolution in frequency domain, the time domain multiplication will result in digital baseband spectrum to get upconverted around high frequency carrier as shown. In addition to this upconversion, we also need to devise a way to modulate the carrier frequency phase, frequency or amplitude depending upon the type of modulation used. It turns out that abruptly changing phase of a high frequency carrier is not an easy task. In order to do this, a clever technique can be used known as quadrature upconversion. Let's understand quadrature modulation with a simple summation of sine and cosine waves. Let's suppose we want to generate an RF carrier waveform with a phase shift of 45, 135, 225 and 315 degrees. This can be achieved by simple summation of sine and cosine waves. For example, summing cos and sine term with equal amplitudes will result in resulting waveform with an angle of 45 degrees. The cos term in the summation is known as in-phase term, while the sine term is known as quadrature term. The summation can also be represented in an I and Q plane diagram, where summing cos and sine vectors in equal magnitude will result in a resulting vector of 45 degrees. From the same I and Q diagram, we can also check that in order to generate the resulting waveforms with 135, 225 and 315 angles, we will need to combine cos and sine terms in the following way. Let's use the quadrature modulation concept in generating our desired RF carrier signal with the desired modulation. For start, we will assume binary phase shift keying where logic 1 is represented by an RF carrier with 0 degrees phase and logic 0 is represented with an RF carrier with 180 degree phase. With IQ plane diagram, we can see that this can be done with simply multiplying the in phase or cosine term with plus 1 and minus 1 while the quadrature or sine term remains 0. The resulting RF waveform will look like this for an ideal plus 1 and minus 1 square wave multiplication. We can increase the data rate of transmitted bit stream using quadrature or sine component as well. To understand this, let's divide the transmitted digital bit stream into even and odd streams. This can be done using a serial to parallel converter. After this, we will transform logic 1 as 1 and logic 0 as minus 1 using a digital to analog converter. We will then multiply one bit stream with cosine RF signal to generate an in-phase 
signal and second bit stream with the sine RF signal to generate a quadrature signal. Both signals are then combined together to generate an RF combined carrier. Let's understand this quadrature combination with IQ plane diagram. Let's suppose that the in-phase and quadrature bit stream values are both 1. This will cause the resultant RF vector in the IQ plane as follows. This means that an RF carrier with 45 degree phase shift will be created. Now let's consider the second case when the in-phase bit stream value is logic 0 while the quadrature bit stream value is logic 1. This will be represented in IQ plane as this where in-phase component is multiplied with minus 1 while the quadrature component is multiplied with 1. The resulting vector will therefore will be an RF carrier with 135 degree phase shift. In a similar fashion, bitstream combinations 00, 0 and 10 will produce RF carriers with a phase shift of 225 and 315 degrees respectively. In this way, we are able to change RF carrier phase in four different possible combinations using a combination of two bits where one represents in-phase component while the other represents quadrature component. This theoretically doubles the transmitted data rate compared to binary phase shift keying as now two bits are being transmitted simultaneously. Great, isn't it? So theoretically we can increase the data rate even further if we represent an RF signal waveform with more than two bits. For example, let's see 16 QAM example. Here two digital bits represent an I signal while two bit streams represent a Q signal. Therefore, in total, 4 bits will represent 16 different RF carrier waveforms having different amplitudes and phases. Going further onwards, we can even represent 64 RF carrier waveforms with 8 digital bits to increase the theoretical data rate 8 times. The idea of increasing number of RF carrier waveforms to increase the data rate seems quite nice. However, in practical life, we cannot go on increasing the number of levels to higher and higher levels. This is due to noise. The noise is present everywhere in wireless communications. Atmosphere add noise and electronic circuits add noise as well due to thermal motion of electrons. This noise will combine with RF transmitted carrier and therefore will corrupt the RF signal. This can be represented in IQ plane as IQ constellation points not lying on their ideal positions. Due to the additive noise, these points will shift their position. For example, in quadrature phase shift keying, if the additive noise shifts the constellation points that much that it will enter the second quadrant, then at the receiver side, we will detect a wrong bit sequence. The problem is that, that as we go on increasing the number of RF constellation points, the noise margin boundaries start to shrink as well. In other words, for an acceptable error margin in the received bit stream, we will need to have lower and lower noise levels. This can be said in a technical term as signal to noise ratio, that is, for a higher modulation scheme such as 16 QAM or 64 QAM, we require higher signal to noise ratios in order to achieve the same error margin at the receiver side. Therefore, even though higher order modulation schemes will increase data rate but at the same time will also require lower and lower noise levels for acceptable error margin on receiver side. Now let's continue forward. We have generated an RF carrier with modulation that represents a transmitted bit stream. In frequency domain, this RF carrier will occupy a certain bandwidth around the transmitted carrier frequency. This RF carrier needs to be amplified to higher power levels using an RF power amplifier and then transmitted through an antenna wirelessly. This amplification is needed to compensate huge amount of loss when RF signal propagates through atmosphere. The amplified signal will then be transmitted through an antenna and will be received at receiver antenna in a highly attenuated form. Moreover, the atmosphere will add noise on top of received signal. To make the reception even worse, same wireless channel will be used by other transmitters as well which may be transmitting quite close to the desired RF carrier. So a practical received signal at the receiver input may look something like this in a frequency domain. This is highly attenuated RF carrier which is quite close to the magnitude of received noise from the atmosphere. Moreover, there is also a high power signal from nearby transmitter which is transmitting near to the reception frequency band. This undesired signal can be quite high in power in comparison to the received signal and therefore must be attenuated in the first stage of RF receiver. 
for this we use an RF bandpass filter which passes the desired signal band unattenuated but attenuates the power of out of band undesired signals. The desired signal is quite small in magnitude due to huge path loss in the atmosphere. If the signal is directly converted to digital form using an analog to digital converter, the ADC will be required to have a minimum resolution step smaller than the received signal. Achieving such a small resolution from an analog to digital converter requires burning huge amount of power and increased circuit complexity. Therefore, it is desirable that the RF signal is amplified so that it's big enough to meet a practically implementable analog to digital converter input resolution. The amplification of an RF signal needs to be done in such a way that the amplifier itself should add as low noise as possible during amplification. This leads to a special kind of amplifier called low noise amplifier designed in such a way that amplifier own added noise is minimized. After the amplification, the signal waveform may look something like this. This signal is still an modulated RF carrier, and in order to extract desired bitstream out of it, we need to convert it back into I and Q bitstreams. Moreover, we also need to shift back the frequency carrier from RF to low frequency signal called baseband. This is done using I and Q mixing in the same way as explained on the transmitter side. The only difference is that the path is now reversed. The RF signal is then converted into I and Q baseband signals, which are then further filtered out to contain the signal bandwidth. There may be also a need for additional amplification if the front low noise amplifier is unable to provide enough amplification to meet analog to digital converter input range requirements. Now the I and Q baseband signals are in good shape to be digitized by an analog to digital converter. They have been amplified, filtered and also down converted to low frequency. The analog to digital converter converts the received signal back to I and Q digital bit stream which can then be combined to generate transmitted signals. This concludes our explanation of wireless communication setup. The basic building blocks of wireless communication, modulation, amplification, filtering and upconversion work together to enable reliable data transmission over vast distances. While architectures may vary across applications, these foundational concepts remain the same. We hope that this video has provided you with a clear understanding of how wireless transmission works. If you have enjoyed this video, please subscribe to our channel and share the knowledge with others. Don't forget to share your thoughts or ask any questions in the comments below. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for more exciting content.